honored to be here. And uh, you know, I was, uh, over lunch, I was uh, sitting back here and thinking about um, William's um, presentation, and I just couldn't help but think to myself, that's how I want to be when I grow up, you know, <laughs> um, the work that he's done, and those are the footsteps I want to follow. Um, but um, I want to introduce myself uh, further. Um, my name is Carlos Rivera, and I'm also a person in long-term recovery, uh, which means, thank you. Which means I haven't used alcohol or drugs for going on 13 years. And, uh, <clears throat> now, there, uh, to me, that's a long, that's a long time, you know. Um, I think, uh, and that's what I have, 13 years. Um, but I, uh, oftentimes, I uh, get, get an opportunity to speak at events like this. And now, um, people are raising their hand with 40 years and 50 years, you know. And, uh, and, and you know, nowadays, I have the opportunity to meet some of those individuals and, they're, and they tell me, oh, 13 years, that's nothing, you know, compared to, uh, to uh, now we have 40 and 50 years. So um, that's great. I, I think that's a goal that, um, you know, that we wanted to accomplish at one time. Um, I want to share a little bit also uh, about who I am. Um, as I said, I'm a person in long-term recovery. Because of that, um, I have a beautiful life today. Uh, I get to do something that uh, I don't consider work. Um, actually, um, this is a way of life. And I think that um, my uh, long-term recovery has been a spiritual experience, not so much, um, you know, just going to meetings and, and working a program. It's actually a spiritual experience. And I think that uh, that's what uh, our organization um, brings, you know, and offers to the communities, um, White Vice and Well Bridey Movement. Because of my long-term recovery, um, I get my family back. I get my freedom. At one time, I didn't have my freedom. Um, at one time, I didn't have uh, I didn't have my spirit. I would say, and and that's because I made a decision um, to change my life. Now, it didn't happen over. Um, it didn't happen quickly. I would say it happened over a long period of time. Um, but also. Um, I, I, I think back to the moment, uh, I guess, moment of clarity, I would say. Um, uh, it was uh, 2004, and uh, it was, um, I was homeless. I didn't uh, have anyone uh, left in my life. Everyone had left me. They closed their doors on me. And for good reason, you know, uh, I don't blame them. <clears throat> but I remember uh, at that time, I didn't believe in anything. I didn't believe in a higher power. I didn't believe in... Um, I didn't believe that there, there existed, anything like that existed, right? Um, and so I think for me, I was just here. You know, I kind of felt that I was just here. And, and I remember, uh, I don't know what drove me to do this. I don't know what happened. But it was uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning on July 2nd, 2004. I, uh, I uh, fell to my knees. And I just looked up at the, at the stars and, uh, and I said these words out loud. I said, uh, I don't know if there's anybody uh, really up there, but if you truly do exist and you can hear me, I beg of you, if you can just give me one chance to change my life, and I promise you I'll give my life to you. That's what I said. Now, I don't know what that meant or why I even said it, but I, um, but I get up and, and, I, and I get up off my knees and I, I continue on, right? I think it was a different prayer, though. It was a different prayer than the one I used to say a long time ago. Now, you guys might, you guys might, uh, you know, um, experience this as well. But I used to say this one prayer, right? Oh God, get me out of jail one more time, and I promise you, I'll never drink and drive again. Or, oh God, get me out of here, and I promise you, I'll stay home on Friday nights and watch movies, you know, <laughs> or it's safe. <laughs> I guess it was a different prayer because you see nothing ever changed when I said that prayer. Uh, it, life continued on as it was. And so um, this, is the way I, this is the way I can best describe it um, for my spiritual experience was that night when I said the prayer. Uh, I, it's almost as if I made an agreement in the physical world. So I made this agreement because I was using my language. But I think at the same time there was an agreement being made in the spirit world. Now, some of us 
you know, might call it heaven or, um, you know, the spirit world. Uh, unseen world is another, another um, name that we use. That there's this unseen world. You, you can't see it with the physical eye. You know, you have to close your eyes and you have to go to that, that place, you know, and say a prayer. And so there was an agreement being made in the unseen world is the way I see it. And it was my spirit and the spirit of recovery. And they were talking like, like you know, like we talk, like we've been talking all day today. Um, and this is what recovery said to me. We're going to give you a chance to get clean and sober because you asked for it. Because you're serious. We're going to give you a chance to get clean and sober um, because you prayed for it. But in return, you're going to spend the rest of your life helping others get clean and sober. And that's the agreement you're making with us. And that's what happened. So today, in everything that I'm doing today, um, it, what I'm doing is following through with the agreement that I made so many years ago. And there's a consequence to it. I think just like any other, any other agreement or contract or law that you break, there's a consequence to it. And for me, I can, I can play it through. I can easily play it through and, and, uh, and see what would happen if I choose to go against the agreement. I lose my job. I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my freedom. Because I will go out there. And most importantly, I, I lose my life. And so, um, so this is the agreement that I'm following through on. Now, as I continued on um, walking that journey, I, I, I got into recovery. But it wasn't, uh, again, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a spiritual experience at that time. It didn't feel like. But, uh, you know, see, I, I, I was raised by a single grandmother who went to boarding school in 1941. And she went to boarding school for a few years. But it was just enough time to, to uh, change her. It was enough time to, to do the damage that it was supposed to do, you know, to our Native American ancestors. And so I remember being raised by a grandmother, and she didn't talk about culture. She didn't talk about language. She didn't talk about the things that today I know we're trying to bring back. Or we're trying to continue to teach to our younger people. But see, I didn't have that. So again, it, it was, I was just here. Not knowing where I'm going or, I didn't, I guess I didn't know who I was. You know, what's my purpose and where I was going? I didn't know those answers to those questions. Which I think that every human being wants to know the answers to those questions. Who are you? Why am I here? And where am I going? So when I got into treatment... And it was, a, it, was a, it was a residential treatment center that was specifically available for Native Americans. And so I walked into the door of this program. And I was afraid. I was afraid. I didn't think I could do it. You know, I was, I was, you know, I looked at others who were in the program for several months. And I said, oh, man, I can't do that. That's too hard. But you know what helped me to stay there early on? It was the Native American brothers that were in that program with me, encouraging each other, helping each other to stay, you know, to, you know, the first time I ever felt a sense of belonging was in treatment. Prior to that, I never felt like I belonged anywhere. So my mom's side, I'm Native American, full-blooded, my mom's full-blooded Native American. And then on my dad's side, he was born in Mexico. So I grew up with these two cultural backgrounds that, that either, it almost felt like both sides didn't accept me for who I was. I always joke around and say that I'm the real definition of, of a fry bread torta. <laughs> Don't ever call me that though, by the way. <laughs> Today I know who I am. Today I know that uh, I'm okay with who I am as a human being. As a spiritual being. Because of recovery, it has taught me how to, to look at the similarities amongst each other and not the differences. You see, in my addiction, I was taught from the time I was a young boy, I was taught to look at the differences in everyone. 
look at the differences in me, you, even, even within my own tribes and family. And what I didn't know was that was actually continuing to, to keep me separated and to build walls, build all these walls up around me. I walk into a large conference like this and at one time before I could walk in a room like this and I would, I would automatically look at all the differences. But today, because of recovery, I've, allowed, I've trained myself to look at the similarities. And that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I want you to take a look at this image uh, that's behind me. And this image um, actually looks, uh, it represents the current conditions of our communities. Current conditions. At White Bison, we, are, uh, we provide technical assistance and training opportunities throughout the United States. So all the tribes that, are, uh, that know about our programs, uh, they have access to, to, our, to our curriculum. Now, over the years, we've developed over 24 programs. 24. I would say out of the 24, there's 14 of them that are very uh, highly requested on a, on a, a weekly, monthly basis. We have a small team of, of uh, passionate but yet critical thinkers who are doing the work in the communities. But this is what our current conditions look like. So as you look at those trees, those trees represent us as the people, right? You look underneath the trees in the forest. I call it the forest is really the community. If you look what's underneath the forest, that is what, you know, you, we, could, we could look at that as soil. That's the soil. But look what's in the soil. Anger, guilt, shame, and fear. Now the forest also represents the seen world. And the soil represents the unseen world. Because you can't see it, but it's there. Now look what our root systems is buried in. It's buried in anger, guilt, shame, and fear. So today we have uh, uh, al alcohol in our communities. Um, a lot of mental health issues, um, sexual abuse, violence, um, prescription drugs, child abuse, missing and murdered Native American women at a very high rate, suicide, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Now, I want you to think about it, th think about it in this way. Think about, uh, just imagine there was arrows surfacing from the soil just imagine that there was arrows surfacing from the soil and and what we see today in the communities is a manifestation of the anger guilt shame and fear see because the alcohol and the drugs and, and the domestic violence that is only a symptom of a deeper problem it's a symptom of a deeper problem which for native americans um, we have a name that we call it today and that's called intergenerational trauma, historical trauma. And there was a, there was a time when there was actually um, a policy, a movement to, to kill Native American people. Now, some of this I share with you not to point the finger or to blame or to play, you know, play the victimization role. But it's simply to know and to understand that what we're seeing today is a result of that. It's a result of that. My grandma, she didn't, she didn't heal from her trauma. So it was passed on to my mom. My mom never healed from her trauma. It was passed on to me. And we could even go further back into our, into our family tree. And if that's true, so if that's true, which I believe it, because I think we have scientists today who are working on, you know, uh, the research. But... If that is true, then that means I am carrying around within me seven generations of trauma. Not including my own, my own trauma that I have experienced in life, you know. So, I attended, uh, I attended a, uh, I guess a workshop um, about just this, you know, just uh, as Early as I got into recovery, I attended this workshop, and it was, it was a uh, medicine wheel, 
uh, 12-step training. Now, I, I attended it, but, you know, a clinical director said, I want you to go to this training and I want you to bring back the information to our community. So I went, changed my life forever. Changed my life forever. I, um, I brought back the information. I started doing work in my community. And I would have did that for the rest of my life and I would have been just fine. I would have been happy. I, I felt complete. Because I, I, I found, like, I found out who I am why I'm here and then where I'm going, I would have been complete. But of course, um, you know, uh, Creator has other plans. And so uh, I attended that training and from there I became a trainer at White Bison. Now White Bison, um, the, the organization was, was founded and built off of Native American prophecies and teachings. I mean, even the name itself, White Bison, where did that come from? Well, there's a prophecy that said, the Native American people of this land will enter a time of healing when uh, a white buffalo calf is to be born. 1996, there was a white buffalo calf that was born in Janesville, Wisconsin. Thousands and thousands of people came from all over the country, all over even the world to go see it. You know, and that's how we, we, that's how we got our name because... Um, because we're entering into a time of healing. Very powerful. So we know, we know that, you know, this is what we see in the communities, right? We know that. You know, when I got into recovery, um, when I got into recovery, this is what was taught to me by, uh, by my elder. And, you know, at the time, uh, I didn't know that this was happening, but... But it made sense to me as I started to look back and, and reflect on my recovery. You know that first year of recovery? Uh, I don't know if you could remember what that felt like or what it looked like. But my first year was, it was, it was a renewal. It's like I was born again. There was a lot of things that were happening during that time that is still with me today. You remember uh, 30, first 30 days that I got clean and sober, I went to, I went to a meeting and... Uh, and I got a chip, 30-day chip. And they clapped their hands and they said, you're the most important person in this room. I said, well, I know that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't have to like tell me that. I, you know, and, 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 then I, and then I got 60 days and, and uh, the same thing happened. Went to a meeting and they gave me a 60-day chip and everyone, you know, they hugged me even. And they put their arms around me and they said, we love you. We love you. Keep coming back. You know. <clears throat> 90 days, 6 months, 9 months, and then a year. Well, that first year of recovery, I was in a spring season. It's a time of renewal. It's like you, you change completely. Second year, I got, uh, second year uh, clean and sober, um, it was very active. Things were very active. I, I was volunteering in just about everything I could get involved in, um, just to be a part of it, just to be a part of the uh, a solution. And so I, uh, I was in a summer season. I was in summer. And uh, now that remember that first year they were giving you a chip every month. Well, the second year they don't do that. They, so it's like they spoil you the first year, and then the next year you got to wait a whole year. And so that was kind of a, a, a bummer. But third year I got into recovery. Um, what season was I in? There you go. You guys are catching on. I was in a fall season. Now in the fall season, things start to get a little bit more colder. Things start to get a bit a little more rough. Now can you imagine being clean and sober for three years and what that felt like? Now you're expected to live life on life's terms like everyone else. I'm no special. Now I'm not the most important person in the room anymore. You know, now we're expected to live life, pay bills, go to work, pay rent. It gets hard. Life starts to get hard. And then I come out of that third year into my fourth year. What season am I in? I'm in the winter season. I'm in the winter season of recovery. Guess what happened in my winter season? I lost the answers to three questions. Who am I? 
why am I and where am I going? I just didn't know what I was doing anymore. I found myself in my fourth year of recovery and I was lost again. And I was like, how, what's, I thought I knew what, what I was doing. I thought that I was supposed to be helping, but it doesn't feel like it anymore. And actually, I found myself in jail in my fourth year of recovery for something from, from my past that caught up to me. Now, I really felt lost. And it is in the fourth year where I found out that a lot of, this is where most people will go back out and relapse, is in that fourth year because they're in a winter season. Because you don't have the answers to anything. You don't know what is going on. You don't know how to take it away. And so, aha, aha, I have a solution now. And I'm going to go out and relapse. But I didn't relapse. I continued through my recovery. I stayed close to my support because that connection with my support was so important. I stayed close to them and I came out of my winter season. And what season am I in now? I'm in a spring season again. I'm back in a spring season. And guess what? I learned the answers to those three questions again. Who am I? Why am I? And where am I going? But actually, I know myself even better than I did two years ago because what I just went through. So this is the way I look at winter because it's not bad. Don't, don't walk away from here today thinking that being in a winter season is bad because it's not. Actually, we're growing. So in order for anything to grow, it must struggle to do so first. In order for anything to grow, it must struggle to do so first. So that's what's happening in that fourth year is we're growing. And it hurts. But don't give up. Don't give up. Because you will, get in, you will find springtime again. And you'll feel it. Now, this, this doesn't work with uh, recovery either. This works in relationships. It works with uh, your, your career. It works with uh, education. So that, you know, each year that we go through that experience, we're going through different seasons. So then if that is true, then think about, you know, in your own life, where are you at in recovery? What season you're in? Think about your work, what season you're in in your, in your work. What season are you in in your relationship? What season you are in in your education? What season are you in in your personal life? What you're going to find out is that we're in different seasons, in different cycles. And this is why sometimes it feels so, so crazy. Things are so out of place. You know, you might be in a summer season in recovery, but in this area of your life, you're in a winter season. So it doesn't make sense, right? So think about that. Now, something is going to happen in the 16 years that hasn't happened yet at all. Those of you who with 16 years or more, you might, ex you might can relate to this. But it's in the 16 years where it's almost as if you go from 16 years to be in year one again. Year one. Like you're still 17 years sober, but you're going back to like being one year again. So if you look at this here, if you take a look at this, I want you to look at it this way. Baby, youth, adult, elder, which is the cycle of life. So it's almost as if you go from being an elder back to being a baby again. Huge shift. But to a new springtime of 17 years and a, and a new four-year cycle of survival. So share that. Share that with others in recovery. It may save their recovery one year. Now I want you to take a look at this image here. <clears throat> take a look at this image. Now, this is our goal. This is what we hope to accomplish with, uh, within the work that we're, we're doing at White Bison, a well-briety movement. 
You know, some of you might have never heard of Wellbriety movement or what does that word even mean? Well, back in the early 90s, um, as White Bison was growing, um, there were some elders from out east said, you got to put a name to this. What are you going to call it? And uh, so Don had said, uh, well, let's call it a sobriety movement. And the elders said, no, no, that's, that's not, that doesn't fit with what we're trying to do here. So then, uh, so then we came up with Wellbriety. Now, and the re- this is the reason why is because the elder said, see, you can get clean and sober. Let's remove the alcohol and drugs from your life, but you still could be a jerk. <laughs> right? Let's remove the alcohol and drugs and you still could lie and cheat and, and do all those things. The elder said, no, we don't want that. We want to be well. We want to be a well person, human being. And so that's what well-briety means. It's a, it's a deeper meaning to it, not just being sober. I think there's power in the languages that we use. I was real happy to hear, you know, most people today when I, when I met them, the way they introduced themselves was beautiful. Because this is, um, this is recovery. This is what recovery looks like. But in a split second, unfortunately, I can look like an addict and, a, and an alcoholic real easy. You know? I do look like that. And I have to experience that, you know, from others every now and then. I have to experience because of the color of my skin or because of the way I look. You know? Um... But now I want you to take a, take, come back to this here. So, so these arrows that are coming from the soil, our goal is to, is to bring back the teachings of our, of our cultural ways. Because if this is what's in the soil, let's just say if this is what was in our soil now, then what you see up on top there is, would be a manifestation of what you see on the bottom. Because first the change has to happen in the unseen world, and then, it, then it'll make the change in the physical world. So this is why at White Bison we are looking at uh, doing more work around, um, you know, healing the trauma. Healing the intergenerational trauma and not just the symptom. And so we want to bring back the cultural ways. We want to bring back... Um, you know, some of the indigenous concepts along with the, uh, the Western concepts and use them together. You know, I want to thank uh, the Wellbriety Society that is currently, you know, here in Bismarck, North Dakota. There's a group of young people and, uh, and they have uh, elder supporters who are, who are um, really making things happen here in, in uh, North Dakota. Um, you know, I'm really proud of the work that they're doing. And this is why we're here. You know, we're here to offer a solution. I'm not saying that if you implement white bison curriculum in your state, that it's going to fix everything and that, you know, all our tribes are going to find healing. But what we're saying is that this is another solution to a bigger problem. Because we know it's going to take a lot more than just one program to make this happen. You know, I know that. But let's add another solution and option to it so that our people can use it. And that's what what I'm here to say. Thank you.